welcome. I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to this episode of the Future Money Podcast. Uh, before we start, I want to say a big thank you to the half million of you who follow my content each week. Uh, this podcast, The Future Money, is ranked now in the top 5% of all podcasts globally on Spotify, with thousands of you from over 160 countries tuning in each week. So a massive thank you for your support. As all you loyal, loyal listeners know, my goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto and hopefully empower you with this information and then let you make your own decision on what their impact could be on the future of money and the future of finance. And to do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation amongst crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. My guest today is someone that I've known for many years, back from our good old days in Hong Kong, Mr. Charles Dosi, who's the CEO of the DYDX Foundation. One fun fact about him, by the way, is that he's an ex-triathlete. He's ran 12 half Ironmans and two full Ironmans. Charles, great to have you with us today on the show. Thanks for having me, Henry. I'm a very, uh, very pleased to be here, early fan of the show. And I just want to make sure the audience also capture on the video here. You've been part of one of the projects I had in Hong Kong, the book Block Kong. And I, I could not, uh, not cover you in this book. So, uh, telling your crypto story and how much you've been co-building the ecosystem of, uh, of crypto in Hong Kong together with, uh, with many other legends. So thanks again for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Of course, that book actually, Block Kong, which I remember is a book you wrote years ago. It's funny on the cover, it's me and I'm next to Sam Backman Freed. I'm worried one day my kids will ask me, who's this guy next to you? And uh, that will that'll be an interesting <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's an amazing journey. Crypto industry is uh, is uh, is rich of emotion, but also rich yeah. of uh, uh, kind of memorable encounters, right? Yeah, exactly. Memory encounters, characters, we all have it. Well, Charles, today I really want to have, you know, I've got a lot of requests from a lot, of, a lot of my listeners about really doing a deep dive on, obviously, DeFi, but in particular on DeFi exchanges. Obviously, there's been a lot of developments on the field of the DeFi, DeFi exchanges. And I know for all you listeners, I know whenever you send me feedback, I really try to execute on it. And today is a great example. And I think uh, if there's one person I could think about to have uh, go to do this deep dive, it was Charles. Uh, so Charles, there's a lot of things I want to cover today, and we'll go through it in, in detail. But first, before we start, um, for the benefit of our audience, can you share with us what is DYDX? What is DYDX Foundation? Uh, and give us an overview of how your decentralized exchange and the foundation operate, and then we'll go more in depth in some of the questions that I have. Absolutely, Henry. Uh, so today we're going to speak about the derivative crypto markets. Uh, the derivative crypto markets are the largest segment of crypto uh, markets overall. So they are 10 times bigger than spot. So I know the, uh, the buzz uh, this month is all over uh, uh, Bitcoin spot ETF and spot markets are very important. Uh, but as per the equity markets, uh, the crypto market have also a, a larger layer of, uh, of the market, which is the crypto derivative. And DYDX is the world largest crypto derivative uh, decentralized exchange. So when you want to trade uh, crypto derivatives, the same way if you want to trade uh, spot crypto, you can either go to a centralized exchange. So think of Coinbase, Binance and some other uh, large brands, but you can also use uh, some crypto native and decentralized type of exchange. So for the spot market, uh, the reference is usually Uniswap. So you can go to Uniswap and start to swap your, your E for some other tokens for, for some other altcoins. And in the world of derivatives, there is also uh, options with centralized exchanges or decentralized exchanges for derivative. And uh, DYDX is the world's largest uh, crypto derivative decentralized exchange. Uh, it was founded in uh, 2018 uh, by a former uh, Coinbase engineer named Antonio Giuliano, which is the CEO of DYDX Trading, an entity uh, based in, uh, in the US. And they've been basically... Um, outsourcing a new version of DYDX, an upgraded version of DYDX a few months ago, uh, which is called the DYDX chain. And uh, is they are really a, an entity which is really a, a mastermind behind uh, the code, behind the, uh, a lot of the, the architecture of the protocol itself, which is now run by uh, uh, an ecosystem of validators uh, supported by the DYDX Foundation, uh, which I'm the CEO for. 
so about 20 people in uh, in 10 or 10 or so countries working on uh, enabling governance with the community uh, working on uh, animating the ecosystem of validators which are essentially running the code uh, for for the uh, for the ecosystem as well as doing some branding uh, branding efforts and, and outreach overall but there is also within the ecosystem of dydx um, uh, two daos today so daos stands for decentralized autonomous organization so essentially think of a, a, a type a new type of digital llc uh, created by the, the community of token holders through some votes and governance to get organized as token holders. And, uh, and these two DAOs are, are, are focusing, one uh, is focusing on grants. So they are giving away money to projects which are building on the top of DYDX. And another one is called the DYDX Operation DAO. And this DAO is specializing on running some key infrastructure for, for the, the ecosystem and for DYDX chain. To give you an order of magnitude of um, what is uh, what it is to be the the world largest uh, crypto derivative protocol, uh, DYDX celebrated uh, last summer in July one trillion uh, with a T one trillion US dollar of volumes uh, on the platform since inception. So that's that's more or less between one to two billion dollar of trading volumes daily. Uh, all of this is happening through some smart contract uh, with users which come express their opinion uh, via some crypt so on crypto crypto markets uh, on on uh, dozens of trading pairs. The biggest uh, trading pairs are very similar to what you will see on spot uh, with um, uh, essentially crypto derivative contract on 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 Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, do you should you want to be short or long on these trading pairs? Yeah. And actually, Charles, it's very, uh, thanks, thanks for a summary. Maybe for the benefit of our audience, can you maybe share an idea of, of volumes? You mentioned the one trillion that you guys hit last summer, but maybe on a, let's say, what are the volumes of DYDX on a decentralized derivatives exchange versus, let's say, uh, centralized derivative exchanges and like the, the scale or the uh, how, how it compares to what we're seeing and also how it compares to spot prices as well, by the way. Absolutely. That's a good question. The reality is today, uh, ninety-eight percent or so of the crypto derivative volumes are happening on centralized exchanges. So decentralized exchange for crypto derivative represents one to two to three percent, maybe, of uh, of these volumes. Uh, DYDX represents one to two percent, depending on the months and depending on the on the market volumes of this market. But the crypto derivative market is mostly, uh, I would say, owned today by uh, the centralized exchanges, the Binance, the Coinbase of the world, um, and this is something which will probably evolve very quickly. And we feel already some uh, some uh, some actions on this front. If we if if you look in parallel uh, how the spot <clears throat> the crypto spot market has been evolving over the years, you can get a sense of you can get an opinion on how will the crypto derivative market evolve. To illustrate that, uh, we all know Uniswap. Uh, uh, Uniswap started from zero, obviously, but Uniswap represents today between ten to fifteen percent uh, of the global spot crypto trading. Uh, so they compete very uh, elegantly uh, and, and very fiercely with centralized exchanges. So you you really feel that the traders and the users overall took the the now the habits of of going and trading on decentralized exchanges. This kind of rotation uh, from centralized infrastructure uh, trading infrastructure to decentralized trading infrastructure is taking a little bit more time in uh, in derivative. But I'm very optimistic on on uh, on the, the kind of market uh, market shares for derivative exchanges overall and for DYDX as well, uh, taking over some some crypto derivative contract uh, tradings volumes uh, away from centralized exchanges to decentralized infrastructure. And I tell you, you're right, because even, even our hedge fund, for example, that I'm a shareholder of, obviously there's a lot of activity that takes place, but we trade mainly on centralized exchange. And then you're absolutely right. The vast majority of volumes now are happening on, on centralized exchanges. Maybe charge, can you maybe, Charles, can you maybe uh, share with our audience why if somebody wants to trade crypto derivatives, let's say perpetual swaps, why should they go on a decentralized crypto derivatives exchange versus a centralized one? What are the benefits for actual users to do so. So the benefits of uh, of crypto derivative exchanges are, are really the DeFi benefits overall. Uh, to give you a very clear example, if you go into a centralized exchange and you want to start and build a trade 
uh, on a centralized uh, crypto exchange, essentially you will lose custody of your assets. So you will have to deposit the asset on the on the wallets of the exchange, and the exchange will give you the right to trade whatever you deposit to them. And we've seen that with uh, with FTX and some other uh, some other uh, some other incident in our industry that when you lose uh, the ownership uh, and the property of your private keys and your crypto, you are taking a massive amount of risk. So that's number one. When you trade on DeFi, you don't lose the uh, you don't lose uh, uh, the the ownership of your of your asset, and you don't have to believe or trust a counterparty. It's uh, totally transparent. You see exactly where are your your assets, and and that's uh, way safer. The other part also is the marketplace itself. When you trade on centralized exchanges, in a way, it's a black box. Uh, yes, there is a price. Yes, there is volumes. Yes, there is comfort of um, being able to quickly come and, and plug and trade, uh, either maybe via API or via the user interfaces. But who are the counterparts? How the counterparts are, are dealing on the other side of the trade? You don't really know. You take assumptions. Uh, that uh, the marketplace is healthy, but you you can't really document that. When you go in DeFi, you know exactly what's happening on the other side of the trade. You can look at the full marketplace. So it offers you really a, a full transparency. And uh, you can also, if you are in the world of hedge funds or in the world of institutions, making sure that you have a fair trade, number one. But also if you are kind of building some kind of programmatic uh, strategies, uh, being able to understand the marketplace, being able to understand the strategies or trying to kind of decrypt the strategies of your counterparts uh, will allow you to build up your knowledge and your understanding of certain markets and adjusting your trading strategies if you are using uh, systematic uh, strategies or aut automatic strategies in, in general. So you, you you trade in a safer and more transparent uh, ecosystem overall, which also has a much larger number of participants and uh, you're not trading against the house also. Uh, for example, at DYDX, DYDX does not trade. There is no prop trading firms. There is no advantage for anyone. It's very, very, very fair, very, very transparent. So it's definitely where the market will end up. We are still in the evolution of, of DeFi. I don't think DeFi will take over uh, crypto CFI uh, next year or the, the year after. This is a process which will take some time. Uh, but the the advantages of um, uh, of of DeFi in general are extremely clear, and they get more and more highlighted by some of the failures we see uh, in the in the CFI world. I think you raised some good points on when it comes to counterparty risk. Of course, that here you're you're you're, you're able to self custody, and basically the only risk you're facing is, is smart contract risk, basically, right? Uh, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that in many cases, a lot of the people who are trading on centralized crypto exchange, they're doing it for other benefits from cross portfolio margining, their better margin condition and stuff. Can you maybe share with our audience, how does that work? So if somebody wants to come and trade, uh, obviously, how does the margin reality work when you're trading on a on a DeFi uh, derivatives exchange versus a centralized derivatives exchange? So there is many different setups of crypto derivative exchanges. Some of them are AMMs. Uh, for example, DYDX is a centralized. Uh, sorry, is a is a central book, so it's an order book type of architecture. So it's the same trading architecture, an order book type of architecture that you will find if you go trading on Binance or Coinbase. So it's not an AMM. So it's a, it's kind of the the order book type of architectures that are the best for price discovery and price execution execution as well on, on large volumes. Uh, when it comes to uh, to the margining uh, on the YDX today, uh, people bring USDC. Uh, to the chain, and then they will build up their trade uh, out of uh, a collateral on uh, on USDC, uh, and they will be able to express their opinion with uh, with leverage on on Bitcoin, on ETH, and and uh, and and uh, close to fifty different trading pairs now. Uh, but it's all starting with USDC. Uh, so that's you're right. There is different uh, uh, pros and cons to to DeFi and uh, and CFI and this kind of centralized database. And when you lose the property of uh, of your assets, uh, it gives some uh, some some different uh, different opportunities. But I think the market is definitely um, uh, identifying the benefits of of DeFi, and we see the the market shares growing. Yeah, I think one, one thing very, that's yeah. So, yeah, maybe one thing which is interesting also to highlight is the market of trading venues uh, uh, and exchanges globally is evolving very quickly. Uh, it's it's uh, basically working end to end with regulations. And regulations are important. Regulations are welcome, but there is something in the topology of the market which is probably evolving very quickly, and is important for everyone to capture. 
uh, more and more exchanges are centralized exchanges are seeking licenses uh, to operate in different markets. Most of the time when they get a license, uh, they will get a license for spot trading. So if this exchange used to offer, for example, let's say in, in France or in Germany or in Spain or some other countries, if some exchanges used to be offering uh, without clear license, a uh, spot and futures trading to their users, and they eventually get an approval for a, li for a license in, 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 in the country, most of the time they will get a spot license only. And these spot license conditions will say you can operate in our country on spot, but you will have to stop offering futures. So we see a very interesting dynamics or where essentially these futures traders are seeing the number of trading venues kind of um, uh, being reduced months after months. And they're looking for new places where they will get enough liquidity, good market making practice, transparency, um, as well as a good, a good infrastructure overall, because the, the, the number of venues where they can trade these perpetual uh, derivative contracts is essentially contracting. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you raise a good point that you're right. Some of the regulators around the world will, uh, I mean, there's first of all, a lot of restrictions around offering crypto derivatives to the public, but you're right, the number of them, this is why the majority of crypto derivative platforms right now around the world are offshore or they're like, they're. it's very difficult to regulate. They will come back to that in, in a second. I just want to touch about one thing that is very interesting because obviously when somebody goes on, on DYDX, obviously a lot of the trading pairs are on USDC. I think I think overall in crypto, one people often they're not on crypto don't realize that, I mean, the vast majority of trading pairs, even in spot markets, everything is on uh, is on uh, stable coins, mainly US dollar denominated, that's your vast, vast majority. Uh, seven, I think over 70% now is on Tether. What's interesting in your case is actually that as a derivative exchange, uh, really the collateral is in USDC. Uh, and really, that's what you guys went to, which many may argue ideologically, it's a bit ironic uh, that uh, you guys have chosen, first of all, USDC as a stable coin, and that you have not chosen, let's say, uh, to use Bitcoin as collateral. If, if we go back in the early days of perpetual swaps with BitMEX, you know, which was kind of the inventor of the perpetual swap, mm -hmm. at the time it was basically Bitcoin only, a Bitcoin in, Bitcoin out. Uh, can you explain with, from, with our audience, what is the rationale of using USDC as kind of the, the not only trading pair currency, uh, but also like the, the, the currency of, of how the people can fund uh, their transactions. It's a market a bit. It's a market demand to be to be very, very, very straightforward. Um, in 2023, DYDX was the fifth largest uh, world holder of USDCs, the fifth largest wallet of USDCs. Uh, so the traders and the users of the, the protocol overall are using USDC because it's kind of an extra layer of security, of compliance, making sure that your your original uh, collateral is also leveraging the, the compliance, the kind of monitoring, the kind of um, uh, hygiene, I would say, on the on the collaterals on the top of the exchange itself you, you, you are using. So it's kind of combining and making sure that the venue is uh, a good fit for as many as people as possible. And even though there is no KYC when you when you go to to DeFi platforms, uh, there is a very strong and very strict demand from the users uh, to make sure that they are not trading against uh, uh, unclear or un, uh, unqualified kind of counterparties. So there is multiple ways uh, you can kind of architecture a, a DeFi uh, a DeFi marketplace to make sure that even though you will not necessarily KYC users because you're a protocol, you're essentially software, the software will be organized in a way that there will be OFAC checks, there will be AML checks, there will be market practice check, and you can also kind of complement these efforts by having a, a kind of the, the core collateral asset being also an asset which is self-monitored and, and come with uh, without uh, as many question marks as some, some other type of collateral. The, the beauty also of using USDC is you USDC has been a kind of the expanding also in the crypto space. So if you look at the history of DYDX, we used to be on the Ethereum uh, side of, uh, of the crypto ecosystem. We used to be uh, running on the um, on, on, a, on a layer two uh, uh, called the Starkware. And eventually the community decided to build the DYDX chain. And having USDC um, available in multiple ecosystems, and, and namely as well in the, as the, uh, in the ecosystems of Cosmos, 
uh, it gave more opportunity and essentially a key partner for the protocol to to kind of uh, team up with the YDX and making sure that the experience for the users, for the market makers, for the institutionals get really optimal with uh, the fundamental values of of USDCs as well as the the the, the kind of distribution and availability of of USDCs uh, all over the, the crypto industry. So on that point, Charles, obviously you mentioned compliance a lot and you mentioned that actually uh, DYDX is trying to, uh, by using USDC as a regulated stablecoin, a uh, stablecoin issued by a, st- a regulated player, uh, in, it, it helps when it comes to compliance. But I mean, for a protocol like DYDX, uh, it's not regulated right now and it's actually, there's no KYC and it's even very difficult for a counterparty that comes on DYDX to know who their counterparty is. I mean, they will know what it is, but they will not know who's behind, of course. How are you addressing the compliance question? Let's say when institutional investors are coming in and they're they're asking you, okay, hey, DYDX or DYDX Foundation, how can you guys uh, give us some comfort around the compliance element? Can you maybe share with our, our audience how do you guys see compliance? And in a way, how do you see compliance for decentralized the derivative exchange? That's really the switch of paradigm, right? So the DYDX Foundation is not operator of DYDX, so we don't we don't operate the exchange. We don't have uh, any kind of relationships or, or trading relationship with anyone. We are really working with the ecosystem itself. Um, it's exactly the same kind of questions uh, one could ask himself when whenever they start to interact with Bitcoin. Like, should you open an account with Bitcoin? Where is a Bitcoin office? There is no Bitcoin office. The same for Ethereum. Uh, if you start to trade or to stake, uh, should I be in touch with the Ethereum Foundation to start staking or maybe creating a liquid token uh, of my uh, of my staking positions? You don't have to. It's basically a, a software relationship. Um, what it means in the context of DeFi, it's a little bit more complex and. Um, the overall ecosystem of DYDX is very much engaged since the early days in having the most um, healthy marketplace, number one, and number two, also taking the minimum uh, minimum precautions, for example. So the, the validators uh, and the front-end runners are geo-blocking, uh, for example, OFAC sanctioned countries or, or countries which represent uh, a, a large uh, kind of compliance risk. Uh, there is constant AML, uh, check automatically made by uh, by the operators of the uh, of the ecosystem to make sure that the the flows inside inside the protocol remain healthy and that in a systematic manner without any uh, kind of human action anything which is questionable or flagged just get isolated and 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 and, and kind of sidekick and and blocked from from uh, from entering you you raise a good question thinking okay in defi i don't necessarily know who is my counterparts you don't really know neither with your counterpart on on CFI. Uh, ones can argue when you go on trade on certain type of of exchanges. Uh, is is your counterpart Henry or maybe Peter or someone else? You you don't really know. So from a pure trading perspective, you take the assumption that the compliance department of this centralized venue has been doing the job uh, well enough. So for the most of the time, you will kind of say, okay, someone else has been doing his job, and if they have if they haven't. Uh, I can kind of point fingers. So there is a big, uh, a big uh, journey which has been starting uh, ten years ago with this digital asset industry. Uh, there is a lot of infrastructure which are being built. Those are very good questions which are uh, we spend a lot of time uh, working on and also kind of upgrading uh, the software overall so that it can it can really uh, fit as much as we uh, as it could with uh, with all the demand from the market in general. Yeah, no, I think you raise good points. I mean, just to be a devil's advocate, right? When you're mentioning your your um, when people are coming from uh, IP addresses from certain countries, I mean, the reality is anybody with minimal coming from these countries will be using a VPN and on the OFAC list because you can actually monitor the wallet addresses. I mean, again, a criminal is going to use a new wallet address, right? They won't use one of those. I forgot how many they are now on OFAC wallet addresses. Uh, but also, can you show me on on a, on let's say on transa- on transaction monitoring? Let's say if I'm coming, I'm doing wash trading. If I'm coming and I'm basically uh, uh, conducting, let's say trading compliance breaches, is that something that DYDX looks at as well? And how are you guys able to monitor those? That's a great question. So within DYDX, within the ecosystem of DYDX, there is today probably close to fifty to sixty different companies with large teams 
working yeah. on different subtopics and each of them will be specialist on, on, on various things. One of these companies is called uh, Chaos Lab, for example. And Chaos Lab was, uh, has received a grant uh, from the DYDX Grants DAO uh, to essentially run uh, an incentive program and, and kind of uh, monitoring the, the activity of traders uh, on, uh, uh, on the DYDX chain and making sure that uh, wash trading or some other misbehaviors will be monitored and essentially flagged and, and not being able to, to benefit from, uh, from any, any of the incentive from, from the protocol overall. So all of these things are being built and co-built by uh, the different actors involved within, uh, within the, the ecosystem. Uh, there is, I will say, organizations which are more visible, but there is, as I mentioned, dozens and dozens of other companies which are uh, being picked by the community via governance and essentially implementing their services. Should it be uh, market surveillance? Should it be uh, AML, uh, AML or, or some other, uh, some other key, key functions to make sure that you remain uh, qualified as an institutional venue? And I think if you look at the, the numbers uh, of DYDX, um, moving between one to two billion dollars of trading daily for, for years now, it's really a kind of a testament of uh, uh, the rigorous uh, design and the rigorous uh, implementations of these market surveillance tools in general. And if there was anything which was kind of a misstep, uh, I believe the market dynamics will just uh, drive many of the institutional users moving away from the platform. So it's it's not coming with exactly the same kind of framework as the centralized exchanges, uh, but the same way people don't really question anymore Uniswap, um, and and they are exactly in the same kind of uh, of setup as uh, as as the YDXs. Uh, those are good questions about compliance and uh, and, uh, and and market surveillance overall. Uh, and all of this is really implemented for, for some time now and, and working well. But do you think it's possible that we will have one day a kind of regulatory framework for decentralized exchanges? Or you think just being able to regulate protocols it inherently re requires a different mindset and we should switch from like a risk avoidance to risk management? What's your view? Do you believe that we will be able to, do you believe there's a right regulatory regime for crypto derivative, for decentralized exchanges? Do you believe there is a right regulations for the internet? Depending on which country you are, you will have different views on what kind of information should be shared for your population. So I think we are in the same journey uh, of regulations. The internet went through probably 10 years ago. Uh, I'm old enough, and I'm 46 years old uh, today, uh, so I'm old enough to remember the very early days of the internet where regulators and, and countries were kind of really surprised by this technology popping up in our life and saying, we were going to regulate the internet. And they've been trying really hard for years. And eventually, uh, the short story is uh, everyone kind of um, came down to the conclusion the technology cannot be regulated, but you can regulate the operators. And I think the directions we're going to see uh, in our in industry, essentially the technology of DeFi cannot be regulated. Bitcoin cannot be regulated. But you can clearly uh, define, should you be a European operator, an Asian operator, or an American operator, saying, okay, if you deal with DeFi in this part of the world, we have a regulatory framework for you. And what I believe is essentially the same way financial products are distributed today by banks, and banks, in my opinion, are essentially kind of aggregators of different pro financial products coming from different financial firms. I think in crypto, we're going to find this very similar uh, kind of distribution models kind of coming our way years after years, where you will see these centralized exchanges, which will have a core function to be fiat uh, on-ramp and off-ramp, and also offering you maybe spot trading uh, with a license. But they will also facilitate for you access to DeFi. And if you access DeFi via these regulated entities, they will kind of uh, make sure that you are qualified to access derivative markets, for example. They will make sure also that you don't access maybe the full potential of the DeFi protocol, and they will give you maybe only a certain amount of leverage, or they will kind of uh, limit the number of trading pairs you will get access to. Uh, because the technology cannot and should not be regulated, but the operators will be. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of um, settling in this in this vision, which is inspiring in my opinion, uh, where centralized exchanges will be gateway to DeFi and eventually uh, this kind of uh, race for uh, 
for regulating technology will eventually lead nowhere but uh, explaining to each operator in each different countries how they should give access to users to this technology. It's a very interesting perspective, uh, Charles, actually, and you're right. I think it's one of the most difficult things, and uh, I think it's very unlikely we're going to be able to see people try to regulate DeFi, you know, because of the challenges, like you said, it's such a paradigm shift uh, on that, that perspective. I want to ask you one last thing. I want to, I want to talk about also the, the new chain you guys have as well, but just one last question uh, before we move on to that topic is really when it comes to uh, privacy, right? So obviously... You mentioned that when I'm trading on a when I'm trading on a centralized exchange, yes, I don't know who my exact counterparty is, but I know that my that, that counterparty, in theory, like we said, has been through the onboarding process of the centralized exchange. Um, here in a in a in a protocol like DYDX, how are you guys making sure that some of the tr trading activity can remain anonymous, so nobody can reverse engineer what some of the other counterparties are doing, uh, and actually divulge the trade secrets or the trade secrets, or you think? This is part of the decentralized nature and providing a level of uh, uh, transparency just inherent to how the centralized exchanges will operate on the counterparty side. In DeFi, transparency is, is by design. So you will not be able to say who is behind this wallet, but you will be able to kind of follow this wallet and understanding how they build their trades or what kind of decisions they are making on the market. So uh, it's a privacy within the context of uh, of not having a label on these wallets, but it's also transparency. So you know exactly what's happening and you know you are having a trade, uh, a fair trade and a healthy marketplace. Uh, it's interesting also to get a more efficient market. So if I understand that uh, a certain wallet is being extremely efficient or better at trading, I will be able to adjust my own trading um, a strategy and, and being better at trading and eventually the market will be more efficient, more liquid and more fair for anyone who wants to come and, and do a trade. So transparency is really by, by design and it's, uh, it's here for, for, for serving, servicing a good purpose of a, a fair and more efficient marketplace. Yeah, I mean, the, the one counter argument to this is in a way in the traditional finance world, that is the IP of firms, right? That's the, that's the edge they're able to get or they're able to, to maximize it. But I think you get uh, it's a very valid point. I mean, the whole argument there as well, if it's going to be, you know, like zero knowledge proof, there's going to be ways to provide some kind of a privacy without actually disclosing. But I guess that's a conversation for another day on, on that front. I want to I talk about actually the DYDX protocol. So I think what was interesting with, with, with you guys, as you mentioned, you guys run Ethereum, a layer two. And now there's been a full transition to the DYDX chain, literally. Uh, can you maybe share with our audience what was the rationale with moving to your own chain? And actually, what I found very interesting, and you can share with our audience, how the incentive mechanisms works for staking uh, on the DYDX uh, protocol. The story of DYDX started in 2018 on the Ethereum layer one. Uh, then the Ethereum layer one started to show some kind of limitations uh, and was not able to host all the very, very successful, uh, the, the very big success of DYDX as an application. So DYDX as a protocol was one of the very early users of layer two, essentially to accommodate its growth. Uh, from a layer two uh, perspective, it's, it has allowed the DYDX protocol to grow in kind of throughput. But it was not perfect. There was still some elements of the of the of the uh, of the DYDX ecosystem still not being able to be hosted by a chain. Uh, should it be a layer two chain or, or or something along those lines? So the challenge was to say, okay, how do we keep progressing in terms of decentralization and making sure that the marketplace does not have these kind of weak points, which are maybe sitting off chain? So, for example, on the Ethereum side, the DYD, uh, an order book which is running on an AWS uh, server. Uh, it's public information because there is no layer two capable to essentially support as uh, the tens of thousands of transactions and orders going every second on the on the DYDX ecosystem. So there was also another another kind of trade-off was that when you build your application on someone else's blockchain, um, you are building your application on a general purpose blockchain. And uh, Ethereum and most of the layer twos are fantastic. I love them, most of them. Uh, but they are general purpose. They are a little bit like a Swiss knife. They can do everything kind of okay. But if you are very focused as much as DYDX is on one single use case, which is derivative trading, you want to get an underlying uh, blockchain, which is really op optimized for your use case and not optimized for NFTs, smart contract, DeFi, and, and many other use cases. So at some point in time, the success of DYDX being, uh, being what it is, uh, 
it has reached uh, a size where it, where it was uh, an opportunity for DYDX to kind of look again at the full stack, looking at how this full stack could be upgraded. And eventually the decision was made after kind of looking at different layer two and, and new layer ones, which are uh, faster and, and, and have all kind of features which could be considered. So the, the decision was made to essentially build the DYDX chain. So what it allows is it allows the DYDX engineers to essentially control the full stack from the blockchain, which you can compare to the operating system of your computer, to the application level, and making sure that these both are very optimized one for another, and the operating system, the chain itself, is optimized for one single use case that is um, uh, essentially uh, crypto derivative trading. So. Um, and then seeing the, uh, and launching the DYDX chain was for the DYDX community an opportunity to optimize and to kind of upgrade the full ecosystem. It allows to get um, more throughput. It allows to get better and easier upgradability. It gives also more power to the community and token holders to kind of decide on the future of the, uh, of the, of the protocol itself. But it's also a way to decentralize further with an order book, which is essentially sitting on the, the memory of the validators. So the validators on the DYDX chain have two main missions. Number one is building and verifying the chain block by blocks. So that's very kind of traditional task for validators. But the second mission for DYDX validators, which is very specific, is essentially to run uh, each of them a copy of the order book uh, of the protocol and matching orders. Um, and that's where the stakers and the token holders are really coming into play. So how the, how the DYDX token, which used to be a governance only token, became a utility token in the context of DYDX and uh, essentially enable stakers, so people who put at stake their tokens to secure the DYDX chain, to collect fees collected by the by the by the protocol, so DYDX takers are being rewarded for their service and support to the chain in USDC, and USDC is essentially the fees paid by the users of DYDX as trading fees. So it's the first time you see an application, a successful application such as DYDX in DeFi. Uh, being able to kind of upgrade this whole system and getting really a, a, a very interesting and, and very healthy alignment between uh, the success of the uh, of the platform and the protocol itself together with the token holders and the token holders when they decide to stake to be able to essentially be rewarded uh, with the fees collected by the protocol in USDC. Yeah. I think it's very interesting the way you guys design it. And I think it's going to be very good case studies to see how the future of decentralized exchanges, even like you said, the, the incentives for, for stakers, it's very, very interesting what you guys have done that. Uh, Charles, where we went completely over time, but this was so interesting. I wanted to continue on it. Uh, we, as we finish, uh, you know, you've been on stage with me, uh, Charles. My favorite bell is with me. I'm going to ask you a quick fire round of questions. These are one or two word questions, uh, uh, questions that I need. I'm going to ask you and I need one or two word answers quickly uh, on that first stack. Hope you're ready, Charles. I'm ready. Let's kick it off. The bell is here to keep us honest on that side. Uh, you lived in Hong Kong, I think, where I used to know you back in the days. What is the one thing you miss the most or you love the most about Hong Kong? Dim sum and uh, the trekking in the mountains of Hong Kong. <laughs> what is the one skill you wish more people in crypto would have? One skill you wish more people in crypto would have? Patience. Patience. Oh, that's a good one. Sam Bankman Freed gives you a phone call. What is the one thing you tell him? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, you actually heard something many people don't know. You worked for the Hong Kong government for some time and invest Hong Kong, promoting Hong Kong. If you could go, if you had one piece of advice for governments around the world when it comes to digital assets, what would that piece of advice be? Don't regulate technology, but give clarity to operators. Exactly. Charles, you have the chat. You're you're gonna you're the new co-founder of a new crypto startup, and you have to choose one of these co-founders. Who do you choose? CZ, Brian Armstrong, Arthur Hayes, or Sam Backman Fried? Brian Armstrong. CZ. Brian Armstrong. Brian Armstrong, why is that? 
just great records, great ethic, uh, a lot of patience as well. CZ and Brian Armstrong are very, very different, but they are as successful and I respect their entrepreneurial journey for both of them. But yeah, I would go with Brian Armstrong. I think he has been spending more time on the regulation side, uh, doing a lot of education and, and staying super focused from the early days. If you could go back to school today, what is the one course you wish you had taken that would have been, a bit, that would have been very useful today? Computer science. I would, I would have done more computer science. Uh, a young person comes to you and tells you, Mr. Charles Dossi, I want to get into crypto. Uh, and he has a choice between different places to work at. One is a consulting firm, startup, the regulator, or a decentralized uh, uh, firm, a decentralized protocol. Where he should go get his first job? I think you should start in DeFi because you can always get the comfort of larger organization later on. But in DeFi, uh, you will be uh, welcome as you are and uh, your kind of learning curve will be uh, accelerated 10x. Charles, you've interviewed many people. You've met many people in crypto over the years. What is the one person that has that, the, the, the most interesting person in crypto you've, you've met over the years? I've met a lot of super interesting people. I think the, probably Ben Delo, which was covered in uh, in Block Kong, the co-founder of BitMEX, uh, together with that Arthur Hayes and some others, which really brought to the, the retail market the concept of perpetual uh, derivative contracts, uh, has been very interesting and in how they get to uh, to kind of patiently build build some some interesting product and keeping their kind of feet on the on the ground. Uh, Absolutely. But I think an uh, Another one, and maybe you will edit the video. I, I, I let you pick the one you like. I had the, I had the chance to work for Consensus, the company behind MetaMask and uh, and Infura, and and Joseph Lubin, the co-founder of Ethereum and the founder of Consensus, have been really an inspiration uh, for me in the in my journey in crypto. Uh, he gave me great opportunities, and we've been building with uh, with the team of Consensus uh, many many great things. So this is clearly. Uh, uh, a kind of a, a character I have respect for and which uh, which uh, gave me a lot of great opportunities to meet up and build uh, great things in the industry. Absolutely. I think both Bandela, what he done on the uh, next back in the day, and of course, Joe Lubin, an absolute legendary individual. And Charles Dossi, uh, as the CEO of uh, DYDX Foundation, the last question, a traditional question, anybody comes on my show, Charles, if you could have lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, who would you have lunch or dinner with? I would have a dinner with Bill Gates. Really? Why is that? Because he has built a lot of uh, very interesting software and he has now a life of philanthropy, which I think he is very thoughtful about and is really looking at having impact with his money and uh, and uh, and keep yeah keep uh, keep impacting the world in uh, in different ways. Not he, now that he has his foundation and all these things. So that, I'm very curious about how you can you can kind of uh, make your career evolve and and staying active and, and impactful. Absolutely love it, Charles. Thank you for being with us today. We went completely over time, but it was such an interesting episode. Charles, if people want to get it, learn more about you, learn more about DYDX, where can they go? Absolutely. So find us on Twitter, DYDX Foundation Twitter, and you can follow me as well on Twitter as well uh, at Charles Dossi. Uh, yeah, looking forward to the conversations and uh, wish everyone a fantastic uh, year 2024. Awesome, Charles. And thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you also for all the great work you've done for the crypto ecosystem from your consensus days to your Hong Kong government days. I've had the privilege of knowing you now for oh, around a decade decade now, and I think you've done a great contribution, including your last book, The Block Kong, as well. Charles, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. Thank you very much, everybody at home. Hope you enjoyed the show. Hope it was very insightful. Again, if you liked it, make sure to also check out my YouTube page, uh, where you can see this live bit of video version of this podcast as well, but also a lot of other exclusive content in multiple languages. Thank you very much, everybody, and see you all soon for another episode of the Future of Money podcast. See you guys soon. Thank you.